In this video, we'll talk about the difference between linear and generalized linear models to additive and generalized additive models. We start with the simple linear models. They assume that the data is independent and, given the same x value, also identically distributed. They often assume that the data distributes normal, with a mean that depends on x and a constant variance. But the normality assumption isn't crucial, and sometimes we settle just for a constant variance. And finally, that the mean is related to the x's in this linear fashion through some coefficients, the betas. Generalized linear models change two of these assumptions. y is now modeled using any distribution that belongs to the exponential dispersion models, EDM. EDM is a subset of the larger exponential family that can be modeled by GLMs. And the relation between the x's to the mu's is mediated by a link function, g, such that g of mu is equal to the linear predictor x beta. The problem is that we don't know the true relation between x and y. It could be linear, it could be polynomial, but it could be anything really. Both LMs and GLMs assume linearity. What we want now is a way to model more complex structures, which will denote by this f of x. What ways can we use? Well, any method that we can think of. We can expand the x features to some feature space phi. There are several ways we can do that either by using the polynomial bases, splines, Fourier, wavelets, etc. We can also use kernel regressions, which are fancy moving averages, local regressions, Gaussian process regressions, regression trees, neural networks, etc. Really any way thinkable to model f of x. These different methods were referred to as scatterplot smoothers, as they are trying to estimate a smooth function from a scatter of data. The word smooth is very relevant to this topic, as smoothing becomes the main goal of the function we are trying to approximate. If we want a very smooth function, we will go back to using a linear regression. On the other extreme, if we don't mind wiggling around, we will end up with a perfect interpolation of the data. So there is an inherent trade-off between interpolation and smoothness, which is exactly parallel to the bias-variance trade-off. The smoother function has lower variance, but higher bias. And the less smooth you go, the more the variance increases, but the bias gets smaller. So we usually want some compromise between the two. And the balance is achieved by restricting some smoothness parameter. For example, the span parameter in local regression, or the penalty parameter in splines. You can see here the objective function we use in splines. The first term is the residual sum of squares. Minimizing this pushes for interpolation. But the second term, which is summing the squared second derivative of the function, captures the wiggliness of the function, and we want to minimize that as well, meaning we want the function to be smooth. The exact balance is controlled by the smoothing parameter lambda. We use mostly cross-validation to determine the size of these smoothing parameters, though there are some more advanced tricks. Now, this was for a single x predictor, what about multiples? For this we have additive models. We move from linear terms to these smooth functions. We usually write the intercept outside and suppose all the f functions have zero intercept. This is done to avoid identifiability issues. If we haven't done that, we could always add a number to f1 and then subtract it from f2, for example. We can also mix linear and nonlinear terms, as you can see here, where x1 is linear, but x2 is modeled by a smooth function. And we can also have interactions. For example, one type of smooth x2 function, when x1 is equal zero, and another when x1 is equal 1. We can also model the interaction between two continuous variables, such as x2 and x3, by using a multivariate function. This was for linear regression, but what if our y data comes from other distributions, like binomial or Poisson? This is what GAMs do. The only conceptual difference is that now the smooth functions are on the link scale. Just like additive models, we can mix linear and nonlinear terms, have interactions, etc. So, if we go back to this table, we have here the LMs and GLMs, and now we can move to additive models and GAMs. We see the only difference is in the way the x predictors relate to the mean or to the link function of the mean. You can pause this video to have some better look. Why is it called additive models? Because of the very big assumption we made that the functions are additive. I mentioned that you could also incorporate interactions or multivariate functions, but you have to be careful here with the curse of dimensionality. High dimensional space is a very lonely space. The data becomes very sparse. 
it's hard to get good smoothers in high dimension, and so this is why the additive assumption is important. Another point is that these models can be considered semi-parametric. The main reason to do GLM or GAM is for inference, and we will usually still care about some linear predictors, for example a treatment group variable. But we don't care so much for f of x. Specifically, if f of x is a third degree polynomial, we usually don't care if the squared x coefficient is significant or not. Just if the whole function is different than a constant and significantly reduces the metric we are measuring, be it RSS or deviance. Now this was a very general exposition of the idea behind additive models and GAMs, and a general algorithm for fitting these models is the backfitting algorithm. What we do is simply iterate over each f term, and f can also be linear, it doesn't have to be a complex moving function. And then we fit it on the partial residuals. So here's how it's done. We initiate the intercept to be the mean of y, and all functions to be the zero function. Then we iterate over each x predictor, and for each function f of k, we calculate its partial residuals r of k, which are the residuals of subtracting from y the current estimate of all the other functions except f of k. Then we fit f of k to the xk's and the k's partial residuals using whatever method we want, local polynomial, kernel regressions, splines, trees, neural networks, etc. Here you can see five iterations of the backfitting algorithm on four smooth functions. For GAMs, it's a bit more complicated. Remember that the GLM fitting algorithm, Fisher scoring, can be seen as doing iterated reweighted least squares, or IRLS, on the working response, defined as this. So each iteration of Fisher scoring in GLMs is actually fitting at least squares on these Zs. But we are now in the realm of GAMs. The etas are the linear predictor, which we said in GAMs are now modeled like this. So we modify the backfitting algorithm as follows. We initialize beta zero to be the mean of the link function. We iterate in the outer loop until the convergence of the functions or the coefficients. In each iteration, we use the last estimates to calculate the linear predictor and the weights, just like in standard GLMs. Then we do backfitting on the partial residuals of disease with the weights. Again, we can use any function approximator we wish with the added complexity of incorporating the weights. Hasty and Tipshirani call this algorithm local scoring because it's doing Fisher scoring in its IRLS formulation using local estimates of Fs. In the paper, they used local linear regression. So this was the general backfitting algorithm for additive models and GAMs, but this is actually not the main approach these days. The main approach is actually to use splines with penalized IRLS, which has simpler solutions. But we'll talk about it in a future video. That's all for now. See you in the next video.